So as they're passing, we're going to get started this morning. We're in a series called In Pursuit, and the premise of the series is that God pursues us, that he wants to be in relationship with us, that he created us specifically. Every single one of us is a special creation, that you have been created by God in his image to reflect him here in this world. Issue, though, is that sin has separated that relationship, and so we aren't in the perfect union that we were when we were first created with God, and so now we experience him imperfectly, and yet he's given us a way to experience him through what Jesus did, what God himself did on the cross, that he's given us salvation, that now in this world we can know who he is imperfectly with the hope that someday perfectly we will be reunited with him once again. And yet in this world, while we're here, we have a chance to experience God through a number of different ways. And one of those is prayer. And so over the course of this month, here in October, we're talking about prayer. And we started last week with the premise being that the nature of prayer, that it must be taught. That Jesus himself, God himself, taught his disciples how to pray. And one of the ways that he taught them how to pray was through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation. And so we're using that as the foundation for this prayer piece within this series. And then we introduced an acronym last week to go along with the Lord's Prayer, which is PRAY. P-R-A-Y. Praise, repent, ask, yield. Each one of those associated with a part of the Lord's Prayer. The P being praise, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. R, repent, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. A, ask, give us today our daily bread and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Why then being yield, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this week, we're going to be looking at two of those letters. We're going to be looking at the Y, yield, and the P, praise. And we're asking the question, why do we pray? Why do we pray? The outline that we've been using, or the acronym that we've been using, pray, that outlines the Lord's Prayer, are great things to pray for. They're a great place to start, but they can also be used as reasons why we should pray. Not only do they help us know what it is that we should pray for, but they also teach us why we should pray. A number of months ago, beliefnet.org, beliefnet.org, did a survey on why people pray. And they asked over a thousand respondents what were the reasons that they prayed. And they came up with a really long list of reasons for why people pray. And they started narrowing it down. And they went back and they asked the respondents again and again to kind of whittle it down to what are the reasons that you pray. And they came up with three. In fact, these were the top three. First one, number three, strength and health. Third reason people pray in the top three was strength and health, which I think fits well with the A, ask, give us this day our daily bread. I think that's something we could definitely ask for, strength and health. Second then was praise. Boom, nailed it right on. The P, praise. The first reason people said they prayed was God's guidance. God's guidance. Which as I was reading that then, I sat there going, so does that fit with the why? Yield. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Is that the essence of praying for God's guidance? God, I want your will to be done in this earth. Well, fortunately, BeliefNet asked a number of follow-up questions to these individuals to kind of get at the core of what did they mean by they wanted God's guidance. And here's what the core of it was. That people want God to solve our problems or give us answers. The essence of needing God's guidance was, God, I just want you to solve my problem or give me the answer. I want to know what's going on. Which correlated somewhat to a couple weeks ago when I so eloquently dusted the front row with a dust mop. Which if you guys noticed, the front row last week was empty. Nobody sat there. You guys are kind of in dangerous territory this morning. But I talked about using a dust mop that many of us just want God to come in and be a cosmic janitor and clean up for us. That we get into these situations, that we get into trouble, and we're like, God, just fix it. And so when asked, when people said that they're asking for God's guidance, one of the things that they vulnerably said is, I want God to fix my problems. The other side of it, though, is, God, I want you to give me an answer. I want to know what's going on right now. Can you just tell me what your plan is? 
And so when we think about the yield, when we say we want God's guidance, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Oftentimes it's, I want God to do it this way, the way that I thought. So God, give me the answer to what it is that you're doing that hopefully aligns with what I was thinking. Because it's so much harder just to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yet the essence of yield is that we give up what it is that we want and that we pray for what it is that God wants. That we give up what we want and pray for what it is that God wants. And that's a scary prayer. God, I want your will, not mine. That's really scary. But as we pray that, there's four things that I want to make sure we understand as we go into that part of the prayer, as we yield. And there's four things about God that we need to understand, and they are these. The first one, the perfections of God are unchanging. The perfections of God are unchanging. God is perfect. We can have confidence that when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, that we can know that God is perfect in all of his ways. Even when we don't understand it or know what it is that God's doing or want the answer, we can know that God is perfect. Here's the caveat to that, though. We live in an imperfect world. And so there are things that happen in this world that don't seem right, that don't seem just, that don't seem like they should happen. And yet somehow a perfect God stands behind it and still brings about what he wants perfectly. An example of that is Genesis chapter 50, the story of Joseph. Joseph's brothers very clearly went into the act of getting rid of him in an evil way, and he recognized that, and now he's in command, he's in Egypt, he's second in charge, and his brothers, not recognizing him, come before him and say, please, will you save us, not knowing it's the brother that they threw into a pit and then sold into slavery. And Joseph looks at him and says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. How? I don't know. And yet a perfect God stands behind things that we look at at times going, that's so not fair, that's so not just, and yet his plan is still being lived out, and he's perfect. And we've got to remember that. Second thing, then, is the purposes of God are unchanging. The perfections of God are unchanging. The purposes of God are unchanging. God's purpose for all of us his purpose for humanity was to be in relationship with him. He then came into the earth that he created. Jesus died on the cross, God himself, to bring redemption for all of us. He wants to know each and every one of us. And from the beginning of time, that hasn't changed. That's still his purpose. Third thing then is the promises of God are unchanging. That God has made promises all through scripture that he will fulfill, that he has fulfilled, every single one of them. And there's a promise that someday this life will be over and it will be renewed and Jesus will return and it will be perfect once again and we can hold on to that. That the perfections of God are unchanging, the purposes of God are unchanging, the promises of God are unchanging, but the plans of God are unfolding. The plans of God are are unfolding, which is why it can be hard to pray, your will be done, your kingdom come, not mine, because even though we can hold to those truths, that God is perfect, that he has a purpose for creation, that he is doing what he will do, that his promises will come true, we are living it, and that's scary. Because we are watching it happen right in front of us. And we have all these questions and we don't know. And it's easy to get caught up in some of that stuff and say, God, what is it that you're doing? I just want to know the answer. Well, I can tell you what the answer is. It's Jesus. But how everybody gets there is a little bit different. It's not the same. It's not the same path. It's not the same thing. And it's not always the American dream. Have you guys figured that one out yet? We don't have the answers. There isn't a textbook that tells us that this is exactly how you do it. This is the way to Jesus. This is what God's plan is for you. If you by chance do have that textbook, give it to me because I'd love to read it. 
God's plan are unfolding. His plan is being lived out right here, right now, on this earth. And the cool thing about that is you and I get to be a part of it. That you and I right now are living out God's plan as it's unfolding. And it'd be really easy to ask questions. So God, what is it that you're doing? Can you give me the answer? Well, the answer is no, I can't. Well, God, can I change your plan? Can I speak to you? Do you really listen when I pray? And the Bible very clearly says the answer is yes, that God does listen. Psalm 66, 19, but truly God has listened. He's attended to the voice of my prayer. John 9, 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. 1 Peter 3, 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. 1 John 5, 14 through 15, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. He tells us to talk to him because he listens. And even though his perfections and purposes and promises are unchanging, his plan is unfolding. So does God change his mind? Does he really listen to people? It seems that maybe he does. In fact, the Old Testament tells us that there were times where people came before him and they pleaded on behalf of the nation and said, God, do not do this. And it said that he relented, that he did not do what it was that he had planned. So did he did not do? Did he really have it planned? What's that all about? How does that work? Well, people have wrestled with that for years. Does God really listen? Was he purposing to do this and then he changed his mind to do this? Or was this always his plan? And the answer is yes. (laughs) It was all of that. But here's one of the things that you and I are constrained by that God is not. And that's time. You and I are stuck in time. And so we have to see things literally. In fact, we do it so much so that I intentionally screwed up the PRAY acronym to see how many of you would be comfortable or uncomfortable. I'm starting with the Y today. How many people are freaking out because I'm not going P-R-A-Y? And if you look at the PRAY acronym, it doesn't go down the list of all the Lord's Prayer in order. It kind of puts some things together and moves it around. And there's some of us sitting there going, I don't know if I can deal with that. (laughs) Because we are stuck in time. And we have to see things in order. It's just the way that we're wired. We see things as this was going to happen, then this happened, then this happened. And if I said this was going to happen, but then it ended up here, then something changed along the way. But God stands outside of time and doesn't deal with the same constraints that we do. And so when he purposes for something to happen, he plans for it to happen, it will happen, and yet we still get to live it out. And when we speak to him, when we pray to him, he listens. Which last week I said that the nature of prayer, when the essence of the nature of prayer is that you must be taught how to pray. Second part around the nature of prayer then is that God listens and then he acts. That God's plans are unfolding, that he's outside of time, that when we speak, he listens and he does something with it. And at the same time, everything that he had purposed will come true. I wrestled all week long with our staff on how we could come up with an illustration to figure this out. Is there a way that we could share this? Is there an analogy to say that we are inside God's plan, that we have freedom within that, that we're not puppets on a string, and yet the end goal of that will end up happening? And I work through like actors in a play, that the script has been written and you can participate if you want, you have to audition for it, you can be in the middle of it, but at some point, somehow, it will get lived out. Like it says in Esther, maybe, just maybe, you're here for such a time as this, but if it's not you, it will be somebody else. And yet that fell short. Or maybe it's like a musician, like the orchestra we had up here, that you can participate by playing, but if you fall out, the music will continue. That the end of the song is written and that there is an orchestra playing it and we get a chance to be a part of it and yet the music will finish with this triumphal note. And yet that fell short. Well, how does God's plan get lived out? Like I got in my car a couple weeks ago, we went on a trip and it's like, okay, at some point I'm going to need to get gas, but I didn't plan where I was going to get gas, but I purposed to get gas. At some point I was going to get gas, but I hadn't decided where exactly that was going to happen, but I knew I was going to do it. Then you got to ask the question, so God doesn't know where you're going to get gas? No. God doesn't know what happens in between? No, he does. 
And yet we live within the context of a God outside of time where we want to figure out what he's doing inside of time. And he changes his mind and purposes for things to happen all at the same time. And it's all true. It's all accurate because he's way bigger than any of us can comprehend. Which then should make you that much more excited to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Because God, I want to see you do big things. What happens when those big things aren't necessarily the way that you planned? What if it doesn't fit inside your box? What if you have to yield your life in a way that you never thought you'd ever have to? This morning, I'm going to invite up a friend of mine to share a story of how that's happening in her life. Will you guys welcome Kelly Hack to the stage, please? Over the last number of months, I've gotten to know Kelly and uh, hear a bit of her story. And in that process, her story has been unfolding, that God's plan has been getting lived out in your life. And it's been fun to hear that for a number of years, Kelly's been a part of New Life. In fact, your time with New Life goes back quite a ways. Can you share how you started here? Well, um, I started attending New Life Academy when I was in kindergarten. Uh, my maiden name is Cadella, for anyone that is still here this time, yep. Um, and I went through 11th grade, and then uh, there were some transportation issues and uh, ended up graduating from Stillwater High School my senior year. But um, New Life has always had a very special place in my heart. So I think we have some pictures of your time as a little one here at New Life. Maybe Yes. I think so. Yeah, there you go. Kindergarten graduation. Um, On the left, those are my brothers, uh, Corey and Jason. They both attended here K through 12 as well. And that's my grandma. And then there's just some pictures of her here and her time all the way through. My first day of kindergarten. (laughs) (laughs) That was... Homecoming and like, I think my sophomore. Were you, were you homecoming queen? Is that what it the was, sash I, is for? Well, it is. I think they were like drawing names out of a hat or something <laughs> at lunchtime. And we got to like walk around with the sash on for the rest of the day. And I'm not really sure what else. So you were kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah <laughs> right. Wow. Right. <laughs> and then so um, a couple of months after graduating high school, uh, I met my husband, Alex. We were both working at Cub Foods, and I was a cashier, and he was in the grocery department, and three years later, we got married, and um, now 21 years later, um, we have three kids, so in the middle, uh, that's Miley, she's a junior, and then on the left is Matthew, he's a freshman, and on the right, that's Annika, and she's in eighth grade, and All three of them attend New Life Academy, so it's a blessing and a joy to have them there as well. Now, I'm going to dig into your personal life just a little bit. You shared a a fun story around how you and Alex met and one of the things that he did to make sure that he could spend a little time with you. Right. Uh, Well, as I said, I was a cashier, so um, I would have to do pages to have items brought up. And so um, what I didn't know is that when I would do the pages, he had it worked out with the grocery guys to, if my voice was on the overhead, to, he would be the one that would bring me items. And so, but what he didn't know is that the more he did that, the more I started kind of looking for crushed cans and smashed bread and asking if, could I have someone bring you a new one? And so that's how, yeah, we, (laughs) yeah. That's really cool. I wish I'd thought of that. (laughs) <laughs> now, well. <laughs> now, in that whole process, though, you said that you agreed to go on the first date with him, but there was a little bit of an issue? Well, um, I didn't know his name, um, <laughs> and so he, he doesn't like wearing name tags, and so um, we had smiled at each other a lot and had a lot of conversations at work, but I just, I didn't know his name. And so when I went home and told my brother I was going on a date that night with this guy and I I didn't know what his name was, he wasn't very happy, but um, I was able to go in the break room and narrow down the names of the guys on the grocery team. And I was pretty sure, and I was right, it was Alex. So, (laughs) but 
I don't ever recommend, like, our kids don't ever do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it turned out okay. It turned out okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Yes. <laughs> so things were going really well. Yeah, and so, you know, last year, uh, we were able to find a house uh, pretty close to the school. We're just like three minutes away, and uh, so we transitioned here in the spring of 2018. Uh, new house and close to Alex's work and um, close to the kids' school. Um, I even started working part-time at New Life Academy, and so it, it just, like, life was going great, and oh, we started um, attending here at the church also. Um, at the start of November of 2018, and life was great, and everything was falling into place, and little did I know that a few weeks later, um, my life would start to take a different turn. So on paper, you're living the American dream. Mm -hmm. Beautiful family, mm -hmm. incredible husband, great house, pretty cool church. <laughs> <laughs> and that lasted for how long? About three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then what happened? So uh, I started not feeling well at work for a few weeks. I was having some really strange, dizzy sensations. And, um, and then I, I just thought I was tired. I wasn't sure what was going on. And on November 29th, I had four near-fainting episodes. Uh, the first two happened at the school. And then the last two at urgent care. And by the time the fourth one happened, um, I was in a wheelchair and I could not pass the neurological exam. And so um, I just remember sitting there in the, in the chair just being completely terrified because my body was doing some very, very strange things to me and uh, we, I had no idea what was happening. So it was a tough season. Mm -hmm. You continued to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a one-time thing, it has continued on. So, um, I have had, the, the symptoms that I have dealt with um, off and on have been uh, a continual feeling that uh, my world is rocking. It's like I'm trying to live in a canoe, so there's rocking, swaying. Um, often when I walk, it feels like I'm on a trampoline, like the floor is bouncing up and down. Um, I struggle a lot with moving my head and my eyes. It feels like there's um, a delay, like sometimes you move and it feels like it's slow motion. Um, other times it can feel like it, it feels it's fast forward. Everything feels like the movements I make are going crazy fast. Um, the symptoms can feel like, um, you, you know, it, they can be very, very debilitating at times. And where I'm stuck at home, can't hardly function, um, struggle to take a shower, struggle to walk up and down the stairs. They feel like they're, they're moving like in a fun house. Um, other days, I, I, the symptoms are less, and I can manage, and I'm smiling, and I'm trying to hang on through what I'm feeling. And then um, I have some days, like today, praise the Lord, I'm actually doing pretty well. My symptoms are minor, and I'm learning to just kind of um, deal with it and all that. But uh, when it first happened, um, the symptoms were extreme and debilitating for the first few months. So pretty much from like November through February. It was really bad. Um, I had lost 24 pounds during that time, um, and I was having a lot of headaches and a lot of anxiety about it because I just didn't know what was happening. Um, and, and you didn't know day to day no, what it was going to be like. No, I mean, it was like some days it, I could have a couple of days in a row that were just horrible and everything was flared up, and then it would start to kind of calm down, and I would think, okay, maybe I'm getting better, and I would start to get confident and be excited about that, and then it would just come back so bad again. And that's been the story for the entire 11 months, is some days I, I feel really good when I wake up, and other days I just know that um, it, it's not, it's not going to be a good day. Um, I have seen just about every kind of doctor <laughs> that you can think of. Um, even in the month of April, I had 29 appointments, and those were not even just from me make, making those, it's, I would see a specialist and they would say, you need to see this person and that, and I would just, I'm getting passed around. Um, I've gone through a lot of really scary misdiagnoses. Um, I, I had, for a while in January, it seemed almost every week I was hearing, you know, I think you have MS, I think you have lupus. Um, it sounds like Lyme disease, um, just could it be a brain tumor? Um, it was just having to go through the grief 
and the shock every time of being told that I had something. And then it would be weeks later, I would see another specialist and they would say, uh, that's not what it is, but we, we don't know. Um, and where I'm at right now, I had seen a neuro ENT back in August. He was absolutely certain that I was having chronic vestibular migraines. Um, but now the neurologist I'm seeing is not so sure. She thinks it's maybe a continuous vertigo. Um, no one really knows. Um, and I'm on the waiting list to get into mail since um, last July. Um, and so right now it's having to submit to a life that looks completely different than it did almost a year ago. Um, and I am I'm a planner. I love to know how every day is gonna go. And I don't know every day if I can keep my plans and how I'm gonna feel or if I'm gonna have to leave where I'm at because the symptoms can just come back. And so, so. so as a planner in this process, as we talked about, one of the things that we pray for is answers. Mm -hmm. And so I can only imagine that, you know, as you've gone through 29 different appointments and done all these different things, that one of your prayers was, God, give me an answer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you sit here today, you don't, you don't have an answer. And I know you shared that there, were, there was a time where you were on your bedroom floor mm -hmm. crying out, God, why won't you mm -hmm. do something? What was that like emotionally and spiritually at that time? Well, at first, when everything started happening, I just thought that God was going to fix this situation. He's, it seems as though he's always uh, brought me through everything. And so I just thought this is going to be a quick fix. Um, but I started to realize after a couple of months that this was not going away anytime soon. This was going to be a long process. Um, it was a few months into it. I, I was getting so discouraged and so uh, worn out from living like that. I, ha I had quit my job. I wasn't able to uh, attend a lot of functions. I was home a lot and it just wasn't making sense. And um, there was one day in particular where I was just at the end of it. I, my symptoms were horrible. It was like everything in the room was moving. It just wouldn't stop. It had been going on for days. And I, I just got up and I started walking around the house. And at first it was just like, praying and asking God to just help me and to just um, help me get through this. And, but it just felt like I, I had been praying those prayers for so long and, and nothing was changing. And before you know it, my emotions and everything just surfaced and I found myself on the floor just sobbing uncontrollably, like harder than I've ever sobbed in my entire life. And um, I remember I just started screaming and I just started praying, you know, God, where are you? You know, where are you? Have you left me? Why are you not helping me anymore? And, and then I was just angry. It was, you know, God, is this how you show compassion to your children? I don't understand. This just doesn't make any sense. And um, I was just so completely uh, depleted and emotionally drained at that point. And so all my emotions just came out and, um, and so that, yeah, that was. So, so in that time, you and I talked this week that your screaming at God, your mm -hmm. communicating with God was in essence a, a type of prayer mm -hmm. that you were lamenting the situation that you were in and yet you were crying out to God. Would you say that was praying? Yeah, well, you're right. It was a one-sided lament for a while. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I realize now that God was taking me through a process. I had completely come to the end of myself, like more than I ever have in my entire life. And every single emotion came to the surface. And I think that God was so patient with me. He was allowing me to come to that point where I just really had to wrestle with all the raw emotions. And what I realize now is I had so many lies that I was believing about God. You know, some of the anger was, God, you're not fixing this. You're not coming through for me. What's going on? And I'm realizing now that, um, you know, it, at that time, I, I had those, those thoughts, but I realize now through the process that he's taken me through, um, that it doesn't always work like that. He, he's not there to just um, make us better the second we want it. I know that he's doing a work in me and he was right there with me 
Um, it's just I had to come to the point of complete surrender in the situation to finally start seeing all the things that he's been doing. So since that one-sided lament and that screaming at God, you shared that he has started to respond. Mm -hmm. How has he yeah. answered some of those right. cries? Well, so as I was saying, you know, for a long time it seemed like he was silent and I was just so bitter. Um, but I had started to remember um, a passage in the Bible that uh, a couple of years ago that was really convicting to me. It's in uh, the book of John, chapter 6. And um, Jesus had been doing all kinds of miracles and um, and then he started saying all these things that were upsetting a lot of people, and um, it was challenging people's beliefs, and a lot of his followers started to desert him. And Jesus turned to the 12, and he had said, are you going to leave too? And then Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? Because you have the words that give us eternal life. And um, that always stuck with me. And during that time, that started coming back to me. And I started to feel the conviction of, am I going to leave too? Um, I'm not getting my way. My prayers aren't being answered. My faith is really being challenged. Am I going to walk away? Um, and I, I started to think about, I had a decision to make. I knew that I could either stay incredibly bitter and angry and walk away from my faith and continue to be absolutely miserable, or I could submit to the situation and uh, cling to God and trust that whatever he was doing, um, that there was a good reason for it. Um, and so I, I started to uh, cling to him and do all, you know, at that point, I, I was so depleted, I didn't know what to do. And so I just started to take baby steps and do the things that I knew would be helpful um, to get me refocused back on God. So during that time, I mean, some mornings I would wake up and literally just, I would just say out loud, God, please help me get through today. I don't know how I'm going to make it through another day. Um, I started reading through some of the Psalms and I could relate very well to the Psalms. Um, I started reading as many books and articles as I could on suffering from a biblical perspective. Um, but I think what helped me the most um, to get me back on track during that time was I started searching online for online uh, radio pastors. Um, and so I found so many sermons um, from people like Alistair Begg and Charles Stanley and Chuck Swindoll um, on suffering and going through hard times. And it was during that time that God used them to just slowly feed me the truth and slowly start to change me and my perspective about what suffering is about. So in this time then, as you have transitioned quite literally in your life from being in a place where you were living the American dream, having everything on the outside looking in perfect, to being in a place now where you don't have answers, you don't know what every day is gonna hold when you wake up. What has it meant to yield your life to God in this season? Well, I've come to realize that my life is not my own and um, that I can, I'm learning to trust him and I'm learning um, that I'm having to tell myself over and over the truth that God is good, he's sovereign over all the circumstances in my life and that whatever he's doing, he has a good plan and a purpose. Um, and so if I continue to submit to him, I know that he's working in me and that he can uh, work through maybe what I'm saying to encourage someone else in their walk as well. Um, I thought a lot about what Jesus has done for me. I think about um, all the suffering that he went through. I think about how hard it was for him to have to submit, to have to come and do what he had to do for us. And um, all the suffering that he went through. And then I look at the suffering if he asked me to go through my suffering could never come close to all that he's done for me. And so I just think about, um, even though it is so hard to submit to what he's doing, just knowing that if he's asking me to do this, whether it's for a season or for the rest of my life, that whatever he's doing, there is a good plan in it and he has a reason. And to know too that it feels so undeserving, but someday 
I won't be in this body anymore. Someday when I'm home in heaven, um, I'll never feel dizzy again. <laughs> and I'll feel good. And, but I don't think I'll even be thinking about that. I, I think I'll be thinking about um, just being in the presence of God, how wonderful he is and how faithful he is to me. Um, there's a few verses that I have been trying to think about um, during this time when I get really focused on my symptoms and it feels endless, feels like um, it's just never going to end and I don't know how I'm going to get through. Um, I like to read Romans 8.18. It's, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And then 2 Corinthians 4.17 for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That actually, when I first started reading it, it, it wasn't very comforting <laughs> because I thought this doesn't feel light and momentary, especially on the severe debilitating days. It just feels relentless. Um, but this is just the reminder from God's word that our life is incredibly short when you compare it to our eternity and so if we can keep our eyes focused on the eternity and the joy to come, it can get us through these hard times. Um, I still don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea if I am going to be the dizzy girl <laughs> for the rest of my life. Um, I continue to pray every single day that the Lord would take this from me. Um, but I also remind myself that God is faithful, and he's always been faithful to me, and I am absolutely certain that he will continue to walk through this situation with yeah. me and be faithful to me and bring me through. And for that, we can praise God that, you know, you're at a place now, you know, where you still don't have the answers, and you don't know what God is doing as his plan is unfolding, and yet we can stand here today and see that God is somehow using it. That, you know, even you shared being up here on this stage <laughs> is yielding your life to God. Big time. <laughs> I am not a uh, public speaker at all. As a matter of fact, uh, Mrs. Heinrich uh, was my teacher. And when I walked in this morning, I said, do you remember in the fourth grade when we had to recite poems? And I had to turn around and say my poem to the blackboard because I could not look at the classroom. And <laughs> so being up here... Um, was a huge submission. However, I have to say that there has got to be some sort of like a supernatural peace coming over me from the Lord because every time that we have discussed and gone through this, I'm usually sobbing and can't get through it. But which I was hoping for, so I wouldn't I be the only one. Usually, right? no, it's like I'm, usually I'm bawling, <laughs> <laughs> cry a lot. <laughs> so well, praise the Lord that He's doing that. And can I pray for you this morning, Lord? We think. Excuse me, we thank you this morning for Kelly, uh, Lord. And we don't know what it is that you have for her life. Your plan is currently unfolding, but we know, Lord, that you are perfect in your ways. Even if that means that for this time she's going through this. But, Lord, like she has said, it's for this time. We thank you for what it is that you have done and the suffering that you went through and how you've paved a way into eternity. And, Lord, I just pray that you use Kelly's story. You're using it today. You've used it in other settings and situations, and you are having an impact through her life. And yet it doesn't feel light and momentary. Lord, it feels heavy and burdensome and it's going to last forever. But Lord, I pray you free her of it, that you take it from her. And yet if you don't, Lord, I pray that you use it in big ways and that you will be glorified in all of it. And as we stand and watch her life and Alex's life and their kids' life, Lord, that we will stand in awe of you. We thank you so much for who you are. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys give Kelly a round of applause. Thank you. So we want to have answers. We want to know. Sometimes we don't. So how do we respond? You know, like Kelly, we respond by praising. God, I don't know what you're doing in this situation, but I know that you're using it somehow. And for her to be up here on the stage, to use her story in the midst of what she's going through, maybe it's impacting you today. And God's using it. And so we do stand in awe of God who stands behind everything. And our response then is the P within the pray. It's to praise. 
And one of the best psalms when it comes to praising is Psalm 148. As we think about our Father in heaven, holy be your name, hallowed be your name, you are an awesome God. We stand with a creation that praises God for all that he is doing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the sky. Let them praise and the name of the Lord for at his, praise the name of the Lord for at his command they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and you rulers on the earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted, his splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all of his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. So as we stand and yield our lives and say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't know what that's going to look like, and yet we know that God uses all of it to where our response in every situation is to praise. And so the rest of this morning, I want to do that. I want to praise. With all of creation, we praise because it's not just us in this room. There are other churches right now that are praising as well. And yet the earth itself, the universe at large, is praising the name of God. A number of years ago, Louis Giglio was here in Minneapolis at the Desiring God Conference. And he did a compilation of a number of things to ask the question, what would it look like if the whole universe praised? And I wanted to do that here. I was going to reenact it. I was going to be cool like Louis Giglio, but I realized I'd never be that cool. So instead, this morning, we're going to watch a clip of what it was that Louis Giglio did a number of years ago as he hypothesized what would it look like for all of creation to praise and then we're going to finish our morning with a number of songs, and we're going to praise. So take a look at this. He says, praise him sun and moon, and praise him all you shining stars. That's not just a poetic idea. That's really happening, because stars don't just shine. Stars also sing. Let me just show you a couple more stars. This one is called the Vela Pulsar. And it's magnificent. It's a thousand light years away. It's a highly magnet magnetized neutron star. Right. It simply means this star exploded into a supernova. And in the case of the Vela Pulsar, it collapsed back on itself in a magnetic entity. And as the pulsar, it began oscillating on its axis. This one oscillates 11 times a second on its axis. And as it is oscillating you can see what's happening it's shooting a radio frequency out of itself when they aimed the radio telescopes at the Vela Pulsar this is what they heard and this is what this guy does 24 7 day and night 365 days a year this is what from a thousand light years away the Vela Pulsar sounds like right now this is it listen to this about you but I that blew me away I'm thinking wow this is incredible you're like well what does it mean I don't know is that some kind of Morse code for something or what does what, what all that mean I don't know what it means but and I don't want to you know go too crazy here but maybe the Vela Pulsar got wind somehow innately of Psalm 148 verse 3 and since it says praise him sun and moon and all you shining stars we're a shining star we should praise him well how are we going to praise him I know let's oscillate 11 times a second on our axis and see if we can send a radio signal into the universe that would join in the symphony of of God's praise from all creation. It's singing. The stars are singing to him. I recently stumbled on 47 Tuck. It's a, a beautiful uh, cluster of stars. We'll show you the picture of it here. There are 12 of these super giant blue stars in there. But the things that are of interest to us tonight are these millisecond pulsars. And right now, tonight, while we're sitting in this room, the 16 
recorded millisecond pulsars and 47 tuck are making this sound right now. beautiful who knew no God has his own string section <laughs> he's isn't that beautiful and we just looked at one 11 times a second pulsar and 16 millisecond pulsars and you start seeing Psalm 48 come to life but look down at verse 7 it says praise the Lord from the earth you great sea creatures in all deeps the, the whale songs could sound like this right here take a listen We don't know the expanse of the worship that is continually surrounding the throne of God. And our songs are great, but God isn't banking on our songs because he is surrounded by a symphony that's bigger than our wildest dreams tonight. Stars sing and whales sing and the birds fly. And I just tried to imagine what would it sound like if you could just for a second be God and hear what he hears. And I can't get us there tonight, but I, I came close. I had a friend who helped me with this little iPad program. And, and I'm not a DJ, but I, I just a little thing, just quickly, and I, I want you to see how this works. Now, this guy, we didn't look at his picture. He's PSR B0329-54. And he's only rotating one and a half times per second, which is not all that much, but we need him in our little experiment we're going to do here, okay? Um, and then we had the Vela Pulsar. You remember the Vela Pulsar, right? So that's that guy. That's a little too fast for what we're trying to do, so we're going to slow that down, okay? And so we're going to put the, uh, the millisecond guys in there, the ones you just heard. Here they come. is unedited. We just dropped this on. And this is what happened. This is what they might be singing.
stars and whales.